something that we put on called the Climate Lecture Series. So that happens weeks three and seven of every quarter except for the summer. And we bring a, a whole bunch of different kinds of speakers to come. We've had a lot of different scholars and academics. Um, we're trying to work more with community organizers and activists and bring them into this lecture series as well. Um, later on this year, we'll hear from folks organizing for a Green New Deal in uh, Central California. So we'll have more of that kind of speaker coming in in the future as well. Um, but as many of you know, uh, the, the goal of this is really just to help have experts come and tell us about their work uh, focused on climate change, climate science, climate justice, and those kinds of topics. Um, Evergreen's Olympia campus is located on the territories of the Medicine Creek Treaty Tribes, which includes Squaxin Island, the Nisqually, and Puyallup Tribes. The Squaxin Island Tribes' habitation on the land on and around the inlets of the Southern Salish Sea, including what is now the city of Olympia and uh, at, here at Evergreen, uh, spans thousands of years. Um, and it's important that we recognize that, and I, I hope, is, hope all of you have time to uh, explore some of the resources we have on campus, including the Native Cases Collection, to learn more about indigenous and native connection to climate change and climate justice, as well as some of the excellent work by faculty and students in Olympia's Hidden Histories Project. So I invite you all to check that out. Um, I just want to do a couple announcements before I welcome our speaker. Um, so this is the second lecture of the year, and we have four more to come. Um, our next lecture will be at the same time in this same room. Um, on January 24th with Professor Shannon Cram from the University of Washington Bothell who will be talking about her new book around um, environmental justice issues at the Hanford uh, site in Washington. Um, also I wanted to bring to uh, your attention the Climate Cafe which will be happening right after this event over in Evans Hall 2205, the Social Justice Center which is a climate cafe and we have some of our interns here will be there um, and it's really just a space to come and hang out and talk about climate issues um, or just to hang out and have some free coffee and snacks. So I uh, really encourage folks to go over there. Um, also tonight there will be a uh, green drinks um, event which will be happening at, okay, yeah, green drinks event will be happening at, um, uh, do you, anybody, do you know where the green drinks event? Northwest Beer Works. Northwest uh, What time? at 5.30. Uh, it's a great time to connect and learn about um, professional sort of issues going on. And I think there's a guest speaker coming in tonight from maybe DIRT, the, the Deschutes Estuary Restoration Team, or that might be at a future event. I'm not really sure. But you should definitely check it out, connect. It's a really good time to do some professional networking with folks here in Olympia. Um, and also, I just uh, wanted to mention that uh, the center has a number of internships that we uh, offer for students uh, with external organizations. So if you're a student here at Evergreen, you're interested in getting some experience outside of um, Evergreen with a number of nonprofits, uh, state agencies, local governments, the, the center has a number of opportunities coming up. So please check out our website, evergreen.edu slash climate, or check us out on Handshake where you can learn about some of those opportunities. Um, so without any further delay, I wanted to uh, welcome our speaker today, uh, Dr. Kelly Kay. So Kelly Kay is an associate professor at the uh, University of California, Los Angeles in the Department of Geography. I've known Kelly for quite some time now, um, uh, since we were both grad students and attending conferences. Um, one specific one was the Dimensions of Political Ecology Conference in Lexington, Kentucky, which is a really great conference for folks critically examining environmental issues, uh, ranging from undergrad to very senior faculty who come together in a really tight-knit setting, uh, and it's a really great time um, and a really great way to learn about people's research. Um, so Kelly's a political ecologist and economic geographer, and her current research is concerned with how the rapid rise of investor ownership of private timberland is impacting forest reliant uh, communities in the United States. Kelly's currently writing a book on that topic, and we're going to be learning more about it today. Um, and she's published a number of articles on the political economy of land conservation, energy transitions, and water politics, among other topics. Uh, today, Kelly will be giving a talk uh, entitled Environmental Histories and Geographies of Public Recreation on Private Industrial Forests in the U.S. South and Pacific Northwest. So please welcome uh, Kelly, and thank you so much for being here.
Okay. Is this on? Is it work? We're good? Oh, yeah. Let me switch the mics for you. I think we're okay. Yeah, we've got a lot of thumbs up in okay. the back, so I think we're all good. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here today. It's really wonderful to be invited to speak to all of you, and I'm really excited. I was telling Anthony, who, as you said, we've known each other for a long time, um, that while I'm here, I'm actually going to be doing some field work, and I'll get into a tiny bit of that in the talk, but I'm super excited to be up here um, thinking about trees with you all. Uh, so, um, yeah, as Anthony said, also I'm currently working on a book called Landscapes of Finance about financial investment in private timberland um, in both the U.S. South and the Pacific Northwest. And what I'm presenting today is one of the chapters from that book that I'm working on right now. I super appreciate any and all feedback. It's all very helpful. So if you have any thoughts, questions, comments, I would, especially being people who are in this part of the world all the time, I think I would really value them. So. Um, hopefully, we can have a bit of a dialogue after, um, after I get into it. So before I delve into actually talking about the book, um, I wanted to spend a few minutes speaking more generally about my recent work. So um, I'm a political ecologist, um, sort of a subfield of geography, um, and my research is primarily concerned with the changing relationships between law, nature, and capitalist accumulation. Um, so currently, I have two collaborative projects going in addition to the book that I'm working on. They're all pretty different, but I just thought it'd be helpful to give you a sort of a taste of the kind of work that I do. So I'll spend a couple minutes uh, talking about those. And again, happy to pick them up a little bit in the Q&A. Uh, so first, um, with Chris Knudsen, who's at the University of Hawaii, and uh, Alida Cantor, who's at Portland State, um, I've been working on a multi-year qualitative research project, I think since 2017 now, um, tracing the end of sugar production on the island of Maui and the ways that Native Hawaiians and local environmental organizations have worked together in order to reclaim stream flow for species of concern that are important for Native Hawaiian traditional and customary practices, including the, the growing of wetland taro, or kalo, in Hawaiian. Um, so the most recent publication from this project, um, which is on the right of the screen, is focused on the extensive system of water conveyance ditches that were built in the late 1800s and early 1900s by the oligopolistic sugar companies that colonized the island and evaded and aided in the eventual takeover of the Hawaiian kingdom and US annexation of Hawaii. Um, so through hundreds of miles of these ditches, water gets moved from the wet side of the island to the dry side, initially for irrigating sugarcane in plantations, but now for a wider variety of uses, including tourism and municipal water. Um, so in this paper um, coming out of this project, we've argued that while sugar production has ended, this ditch infrastructure that remains continues to instantiate plantation logics and colonial era approaches to environmental management, um, which causes issues um, and path dependencies for the future of the island and the future of Native Hawaiian communities, even after sugar production itself has faded away. Um, so the photo on the left here is a photo from our field work. Um, this is um, Lucien, she's a Hawaiian activist, um, very involved in the community, and she's taking us on a walking tour of these water conveyance ditches. It's really remarkable infrastructure, literally carved into the rocks. It's it's really hard to undo. So you know, thinking about things like that um, is really, I think, critical when we think about transitions. Uh, similarly, I guess I didn't realize I was so presenting on so many transitions today. Um, but similarly, on another transition that I've been doing work on, um, I've been working since 2020 with one of my doctoral students um, on the challenges uh, for a just transition as Los Angeles has committed itself to shift to 100% renewable energy by 2035. Um, so. We've had a couple of pieces of work come out of this project, um, Andrea and I, including this report, Phasing Out Fossil Fuel Infrastructure in Los Angeles. Um, and to give you sort of some context for this project and what we've been thinking about, in 2019, Eric Garcetti, who was then mayor of Los Angeles, announced what he was calling the LA Green New Deal. And the centerpiece of this plan was the promise to shut down three natural gas-fired power plants located along the coast in southern Los Angeles County. 
Los Angeles has the, county, the country's largest vertically integrated and municipally owned utility, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. So this means that first, that the city itself owns and manages the utility, which is not the case in many places in the US, and also that the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, or LADWP for short, owns all of its own power plants and all of its own transmission lines. So this is really significant for thinking about how this transition might work. Um, so these three uh, power generating stations, these natural gas fired power plants that are going to be shut down, account for approximately 40% of LADWP's total capacity, but importantly, currently make up 89% of the utility's capacity within Los Angeles County. So this is a huge amount of the total capacity that's localized is natural gas fired power plants, almost 90%. In order to provide enough power for such a large city, the system currently depends on the production of power in five US states, which are connected through including, uh, there's a, an LADWP facility in Oregon on the Columbia River for hydropower, um, as well as in a number of other places. But so um, five states connected through 3,600 miles of transmission lines and 10,400 miles of distribution lines. So the loss of almost 90% of its localized capacity is a serious one, and the announcement about the closure of these three plants inflamed conflict with the heavily unionized LADWP labor force, who then began protesting the mayor and funding candidates who are running on anti-climate platforms. And this is um, one of these groups, Working Californians. These are, this is sort of an umbrella group representing um, the IBEW chapter that, um, that works at LADWP. These are union workers for the city who are protesting the LA Green New Deal. Um, so as a generally, as you know, I think people understand Los Angeles to be a relatively progressive city. I think many people were surprised at the reaction of the union. Um, and in the work that uh, my collaborator Andrea and I have been doing, both in um, this report and also a paper we published in the journal Political Geography, um, we try and understand why this happened. And we focus our attention on what we call sort of a scalar mismatch between the current and future energy system. So in order to pick up the sort of lost capacity within LA County, all of these transition plans are planning on extending this network outside of LA, outside of California, to potentially as many as 10 states. So we see sort of a displacing of a local capacity um, to outside of uh, Los Angeles. And as a result, a lot of these workers who work at these plants in the city are potentially seeing job losses that are not being made up in meaningful ways where they live. Um, and so I think one of the things that we really try and have been trying to bring out with this project and are continuing to look at as we, um, we continue to push forward on this project looking at um, transitioning some of these plants to green hydrogen, including one that's, um, that's in Utah. Um, there's a coal to natural gas to now potentially green hydrogen project happening um, in rural Utah that's entirely owned by LADWP. I think one of the things we're really trying to get at is trying to understand both uh, how important geography is in this for how workers end up being impacted, but also for how we think about environmental justice and what kinds of communities are impacted. I mean, green hydrogen technology is emergent. It's, it's not necessarily normalized at utility scale. And the fact that it's being tried out not in one of the three plants in Los Angeles, but in a far off um, plant owned by DWP in rural Utah, I think is really important um, as we think about you know, how we do these kinds of transitions. Okay, so that's kind of what I've been working on aside from what I'm about to talk about for the rest of today. But I just thought if people had questions on either of these projects, it might be nice to, to throw them out there. Um, okay. So in 2005, the vertically integrated pulp and paper giant International Paper announced the sell-off of 5.1 million acres of forest land to Resource Management Service LLC, a Timberland Investment Management Organization, or TMO for short. This $6.1 billion deal was the largest forest land transaction in US history, and as many of my research informants have argued, was the sort of metaphorical crest of a long wave of corporate restructuring and investor interest in owning US Timberland. The international paper sell-off is just one of many, many similar large, yeah, large land sales that have occurred across the US in recent decades. 
And as a result of many sales like this one, institutional investors like pension funds or university endowments have come to be the largest owners of private forests across nearly all rural timber dependent communities in the United States. And this is kind of the starting point for my research and what I've, I've been working on. So beginning in the 1990s, the vast majority of vertically integrated forest products companies, so paper companies and lumber companies, restructured to receive preferential tax treatment. And one major outcome of this process, uh, as mentioned, was a huge transfer of forest lands into the hands of institutional investors. Generally, large players in the lumber and paper industry took two routes. So they would either sh sort of shed their land holdings in order to streamline their business operations, and this is here what international paper is doing. They mostly produce paper, but they no longer hold forests that provide an input to those paper mills. They have you know, negotiated agreements or other ways of acquiring paper, but they no longer hold land. On the flip side, um, what we saw at this time as well is that Many large companies that used to work, that used to hold lots of uh, capacity, including mills, other facilities, they sort of vertically integrated, employed people, and also held land, ended up shedding that processing capacity, and a lot of it went up for sale. And many of the companies, I mean, some of these might be familiar names, uh, companies like Warehouser, um, let's see, who else have we got? Um, Rainier. Um, I feel like around here, I'm sure, well, Weyerhaeuser is the largest landowner in the United States, but a big landowner in Washington, so maybe familiar to some of you all. Um, but anyway, this is to say that uh, many of these companies um, had to basically shed their other business operations to allow them to legally function primarily as real estate holders and investors, and as a result are able to pay reduced corporate taxes. Um, as a result of restructuring. So I know this sounds kind of complicated, but I think basically the, the sort of takeaway that I'm hoping that you'll have is that we sort of have a split in the industry. On the one hand, we have a huge amount of land that goes up for sale for com from companies like International Paper, and on the other hand, we have companies that used to primarily hold their land as an input to their mills, shedding those mills and becoming real estate investors. Um, so we have sort of two big paths there. And so as you can see on the chart on the screen, which comes from a 2016 paper um, from Brooks Mandel, in 1969, nearly all of the largest owners of private forest land in the US were traditional forest products companies, which I've described where they, they owned their land, they employed their own loggers and truckers, ran their own mills and processing facilities. They are vertically integrated. By 2016, we saw a major change in who owns US timberland. So first we have the creation of TIMOs, or Timber Investment Management Organizations. These are entities that are effect effectively like private equity firms that manage land on behalf of institutional investors. And then we also have the growth of REITs, or Real Estate Investment Trusts. Um, these are companies that are publicly traded but primarily function as real estate owners and investors. So these are for formerly vertically integrated companies that mostly are land holding companies now. Um, and so this is a means for them to reduce the tax burden for their investors. So in this book, or in the book, this book, the book I'm talking about right now, uh, I describe this process as the vertical disintegration of the industry, and I delve into the implications of the changing nature of ownership for communities that live, work, and recreate on private industrial timberland. So in particular, I focus on three key differences between the era of big vertically integrated ownership and the current moment of TIMO and REIT ownership and management. Um, so these big changes that I look at are first, changes in labor and employment, and a lot of what I discussed there has to do with the rise of contract work, the dissolution of good union jobs, and a shift in the industry towards right-to-work states. So we have a huge growth in south and uh, timber uh, ownership and investment in the southeast um, with sort of a decline in the Pacific Northwest. Secondly, I um, spend a lot of time looking at how the way that value is generated from the forest has changed. So for these big vertically integrated companies, they primarily saw their forests as an input to their mills, which were really their cost center. That was where they were making their profits. Now, um, many land forest landowners um, sort of see the bulk of their profits coming from the real estate. The, the, tree, the land is the valuable asset now. It's not just an input. 
And so, um, you know, these real land is being treated as a real estate investment, and multiple revenue streams are being derived from it. So it's a it's a pretty different way of conceptualizing why one might hold forest land as um, as a company. And then finally, what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of today and what this chapter looks at is um, how public access and recreation to, um, on these properties changed over time. So in the chapter I'm going to be talking about today, I'm sort of guided by two research questions, um, which are on the screen. I'm mostly focusing today on the first one, how are private industrial timberlands used for recreational and subsistence purposes, and how has their use changed over time? And I think that this is a project that I'm interested in because many of us think all the time about forests, potentially, but we think about public lands, right? We're talking about Forest Service land or state-owned land. Um, and much of the forest land in the US is owned by private companies, right, in addition to, to private owners. And I think while there's so much research on the history of recreation on public land, there's actually much less on how we use private lands for recreation. Um, but it, Private industrial timberland has historically been and continues to be a major source of public recreation opportunities, um, not just in the sites that I'm looking at, but in many states because it's legally mandated that they, um, if they receive tax, uh, sort of reduced timber taxation rates that some kind of public access is required. Um, that is not the case in Washington or Oregon, um, but nevertheless, there's a long legacy, as I'm about to get into, of people using those, those properties for um, recreation. And so to tell you a bit about kind of like how I started doing this work, um, my, my research is supported by a lot of data. I've done a lot of participant observation at industry conferences. So I've gone to timber investment conferences and talked with and met the people that actually operate in this industry. Um, a lot of my research is based on archives, strong environmental history components. So I've used the archives at the Forest History Society, Oregon Historical Society, U of O, and University of Washington Special Collections. I'm actually going tomorrow to University of Washington to look at some labor archives for this, you know, continuing to collect stuff for this. Um, I've done 75 interviews, which is a lot, with all sorts of folks. Uh, and then I've also maintained a website where people are allowed to sort of share their experiences with Timberland ownership change, though it has honestly not been particularly useful or popular. I'm happy to discuss that if anyone's interested. Um, I think probably I'll just very quickly say that my research, I said I am a political ecologist, is sort of grounded in this field where I'm basically seeking to understand um, the complex relationships between nature and society by analyzing um, forms of access and control over resources and what kinds of implications those have for environmental health and sustainable livelihoods. And in particular, um, I'm, I'm trying to trace that historically, so um, drawing on this field of historical political ecology as well. Okay, so I want to start with this sportsman's map. Um, which is from the University of Washington Library Special Collections. It's from 1971, and it's a collaborative effort between state agencies and large lumber and paper companies like Crown Zellerbach, Boise Cascade, International Paper, and Weyerhaeuser. Um, this is just one of multiple maps that I have like this from this era, and I think it really captures a moment in time where integrated pulp and paper companies had very large land holdings sort of checkerboarded amongst private or public holdings, and where access to these properties was normalized for both employees as well as for local community. So here's the map itself, um, which shows lands that are open for hunting in the Willapa Hills region of Southwest Washington. You can see at the very bottom, Longview, Kathlamet, so we're very close to Oregon here. Um, but this is, you know, across these many companies and public lands, the sort of understanding of a complex of potentially usable hunting land that is both public and privately owned sort of woven together in this way. Um, other maps that I have like this, and you know, one of the things I think I started by saying while I'm here, I'm gonna be doing a little bit of field work. One of the things I'm excited about is I'm hopefully gonna sort of chase down some of the um, places depicted on these maps, because a lot of them have not just hunting, but campgrounds, hiking trails, picnic areas, other things that I think um, will be very cool to sort of dig into and see what's going on in those places at the moment. Okay, 
So historians and other scholars have written extensively about the growth and interest in outdoor recreation in the period immediately following World War II, with increasing amounts of both disposable income and free time, plus widespread automobile ownership, Americans increasingly sought to get out into nature. A 1955 report, for example, highlights the speed of this growth, stating that, quote, recreation use of the national forests increased from 27 million visits in 1950 to almost 46 million in 1955, an increase which is greater percentage-wise and in actual numbers than the population increase in the United States during the same period. So within the federal agencies, this meant a huge investment in expanding and improving public lands and their offerings. The National Park Service, for example, during this era began something called Mission 66 um, in 1956, a program to update its facilities for, by its 50th birthday in 1966. Similarly, the US Forest Service ran a parallel program called Operation Outdoors. So we have this huge interest in getting out into the woods, out to do recreational activities. We have our various public agencies really responding um, but in what follows, I draw on um, articles from corporate newsletters from a lot of these timber companies at this time, um, from the 1950s and 60s, uh, in order to show how Americans were also using private land for recreation at this time. Um, much of what I'm showing is from the Weyerhaeuser Company. I've used their um, corporate records really extensively at the Forest History Society, but um, I will also show examples from other companies at this time as well. Also, I think, um, the Weyerhaeuser stuff is interesting because it's happening where we are right now versus some of the other sources I have that are maybe more diffuse across the world. So this um, Weyerhaeuser is, has been and is headquartered in Washington, originally in federal way and now in sort of an office tower in Seattle, um, and they've long been a major landowner and player in the Pacific Northwest. So the first image I have on the screen here is from a 1955 article in Weyerhaeuser Today, the company's corporate newsletter, depicting a family camping in the St. Helens tree farm near Mount St. Helens. So the openness of tree farms to recreation at this time is underscored from another, by another article um, in a newsletter from one year later entitled Public Parks on Private Property. And the authors write, quote, summer vacationists in Washington and Oregon this year found more and better evidences of a unique Western service. 14 public parks provided by Weyerhaeuser Timber Company on its tree farm lands. Facilities provided include picnic tables, fireplaces, covered kitchens, restrooms, water, and firewood. Overnight camping is permitted and swimming and fishing are available at nearly every park. No charge of any kind is made for the use of these facilities. So while employees and community members have been informally using um, you know, the land near their homes for recreation since the 1900s, it was during this post-war boom in outdoor recreation that they decided to formalize these policies and try and encourage employees to concentrate their hunting, fishing, and camping on tree farm land. I mean, I think I would argue there are potentially strategic reasons for doing this. Um, in particular, forest products companies owned vast swaths of land, which were very hard to oversee and manage at this time. We did not have things like geospatial technologies. Um, and so building goodwill with the community through open access was an important means of ensuring, I think, what some people would term social license to operate, um, but also gets more eyes out on the land, making sure you know if a fire were to break out or something, that that would be um, something that would um, be made uh, apparent to them. Uh, the next image from, also from Weyerhaeuser today is from a 1959 article called Deer and Timber are Twin Crops. The caption touts that, quote, Weyerhaeuser welcomes all true sportsmen as one good conservationist always welcomes another. In, <laughs> sorry. In this specific article, the authors go to great lengths to de demonstrate their commitment to deer conservation and their welcoming spirit. The authors write, for example, that, quote, some tree farms go so far as to provide free coffee, free firewood, and even lodging facilities for the hunters. Others offer transportation and company vehicles to areas that would otherwise be difficult to reach. The welcome sign that figuratively hangs on Weyerhaeuser's gates has drawn a flood of compliments from grateful hunters who face less pleasant prospects when hunting in other parts of the state or country. 
And I think this article is interesting because it makes a strong case for the possibility that tree farms might even be better deer habitat than old growth forests. They say that the checkerboard harvesting patterns in these you know, vast tree farms, these clear cuts, increase forest edge, providing critical habitat for deer to multiply. Additionally, as the caption on another image in the article touts, quote, better than nature in the raw, well-tended tree farmlands give the deer excellent food and cover. Okay, this is from a 1955 article and photo series entitled, Tree Farms Are for Work and Play. In it, the author touts the benefits of multiple use, which is sort of a guiding principle, forest management for a lot of our federal and state agencies, noting that, quote, multiple use means much more than recreational use. Beyond recreation, community members make subsistence use of the company's tree farms. As the text in the article reads, quote, some people make a living by harvesting the byproducts of the forest, such as wild berries, Christmas trees, fur-bearing animals, ferns for floral and decorative use, and cascara bark for medicines. While much of the collection of these products is by agreement, those agreements, I think importantly, were between community members and small-scale operators or employees rather than being monetized and offered for competitive bidding, which is how much of the sort of um, collection in uh, private timberland operates today. Okay, so. While most of the ones that I've pointed to thus far are from Weyerhaeuser today, I just do want to underscore that this is indeed a trend amongst the big companies at this time. Um, so this is um, from Boise, um, this is an article on multiple use from Boise Cascades corporate newsletter echoing extremely similar themes of open access and multiple use, as well as describing plans to expand existing campgrounds and build a new hiking trail for use by the community. Um, similarly, this is from Georgia Pacific's newsletter. Um, and moving into the 1960s, there's a, an interesting notable shift in tone in these articles that I've looked at from welcoming visitors to sort of touting the benefits that the Timberland provides, presumably in a defensive move against the passage of the Wilderness Act in 1964. Um, so this example from 1965 is from Georgia Pacific's corporate newsletter. Um, and, um, you know, I think... While advertisements of free and open access in these types of newsletters begins trailing off, I followed a lot of the company's newsletters like sort of in a long arc, and a lot of it begins to trail off by the 1970s. That doesn't mean that communities are not continuing to use these amenities that have been provided. And I do see evidence like up to the 70s, 80s across a lot of these archives of the company still very much acknowledging that they're providing these services. Okay, so a lot of what I've been trying to do lately with my research is to bring this story up to the present. I have these really interesting snippets. Um, there's, as far as I can tell, virtually nothing has been published on these sort of interesting campgrounds and amenities that are being provided um, pretty uh, comprehensively by a lot of these big companies at the time. It's very different from how they operate today, um, even ones that are still vertically integrated, of which there are a few. Um, but so. Um, I'm also trying to understand how new owners with different logics and different ways of generating profit from the forest are changing these longstanding norms of access, right? Because like I said, while we don't see it in the newsletters that I'm tracking per se, in interviews with people who live in communities, including many of you, I'm sure you've gotten out on um, private land over the course of your lifetimes if you've grown up in the Pacific Northwest. And those norms are definitely changing as we see different owners, particularly investors, acquiring property. So one example of um, this is Nisika, which is a campsite on Weyerhaeuser's Millicoma tree farm in Coos County, Oregon, and is now, a, you know, it's kind of like what happened to all these places was sort of what's motivating me here, right? So um, uh, I was interviewing someone and he was like, oh yeah, Nisika's, you know, owned by Coos County now. Um, and I was very curious, so I ended up um, basically deciding to go out there and try and meet with who was explained to me to be this live-in groundskeeper named Dan and ended up driving 19 miles down logging roads uh, to get to Nisika, which is, you know, this is a similar kind of thing that I've shown from a lot of these other parks. Um, and here I end up actually out there. So when I arrived, I met Dan, a veteran who was injured in combat, who was preparing the place for, the, for campers that weekend. He's a sort of live-in groundskeeper. This is really his place. Um, 
I really can't like state enough how much he's made his life around this place. All of the images on the screen are things that he's crafted to the benefit of people that are wanting to use this place for camping. So you see he, he um, you know, sort of made these picnic tables, pieces of art. He built an amphitheater with a fire pit. Um, and he's really embraced and cared for Nasika. Um, he said to me, which I found a little dark, honestly, that he hopes he can die there. Um, not like imminently, uh, but that he wasn't sure how he could possibly avoid homelessness if um, he were to lose his job as a groundskeeper there. Um, but Weyerhaeuser, now restructured as a real estate investment trust, um, is obviously not particularly invested in providing these same kinds of services to the community or to their employees because they operate in a fundamentally different structure with different operating logics. And so they've been trying to sell the land on which Nasika sits. They have a lease with Coos County, but they still own the property. Um, and so it's sort of this waiting game. I actually should probably check and see where things are at. But there is a serious concern, right, that it's just a transaction now. They're just a real estate company. Um, and so it's unlikely that these profit-driven owners would have strong reason to continue leasing to Coos County unless it was profitable enough. And I think the uncertain fate of Nasika is one example of how things have changed so drastically from what I was showing you in the 50s and 60s, right? Um, so uh, I'm, as I said at the beginning when I showed this map, um, I'm going to be trying to drive around and find the like various Washington state versions of Nasika and see what's become of these picnic areas, campsites, et cetera, on um, Timberland. Who owns them? What's going on with them? So I'm, I'm really excited to do that. OK, another example that has come up during my research is the Valley of the Giants in Polk County, Oregon. So this is a popular hike um, with old growth trees. And it's situated technically on Bureau of Land Management land, so public land. But it's extremely hard to access without using the roads of adjacent landowners. So while, as we saw with the 1971 map that I showed earlier, there used to be freer passage to use private logging roads to access neighboring public lands, many investor owners do not have a reason to take on that liability. And so gating roads has become much more common. Um, I think this lack of interest in taking risk um, is compounded by the fact that many of these new owners have very little incentive to invest in or maintain logging roads. Um, during the era of vertically integrated ownership, many of these large companies had entire crews dedicated to the task of road maintenance. Uh, now with, we, with absentee investor owners, there's much less motivation to maintain these roads. So as a result, um, and as you'll see from this screenshot from All Trails, uh, some reviews of the Valley of the Giants, it's really a gamble if it's even possible to get there or not, because there are so many adjacent landowners, many of which are managing land on behalf of pension funds, other kinds of institutional investors, who just gate the roads. Sometimes they're open, sometimes you can negotiate with them. But you know, there's also a lot of times where you might show up and it's no longer, there's no longer free passage. This isn't just an issue with the Valley of the Giants or with hiking in general, right? But if you live in rural areas in the Pacific Northwest, uh, it's not uncommon to need to rely on like logging roads to get from point A to point B. And so this is increasingly going to become an issue as gating becomes much more normalized. OK, and then. The last piece, I, I tried to mostly focus on the examples I have from here, just because I thought they might be more interesting. Um, but one big piece of the chapter that I write about, because my other field site is in south um, southeastern Georgia, like on the Florida-Georgia line. Um, and so just to sort of bring in an example from that to show that this is not simply happening in the Pacific Northwest, uh, the norms of hunting have also changed a quite, quite a bit from what was described in some of those newsletter articles from earlier. And so I'm going to be honest and say that while I was initially doing research in the South, I kind of was assuming that there would have never been a culture of um, free and open access to land. I think there's a stronger culture of private property there, and we don't see this sort of checkerboarded nature of public and private land like we see here. Um, but I was surprised to learn that the paper and lumber companies there operated very similarly to how they did here until the 1970s or so. 
Um, after that, a culture of hunting leasing emerged, which is not necessarily taken off in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but these initial leases were nominal charges intended to cover just the property taxes on Timberland. So companies would sort of negotiate with their employees, say, you pay the property taxes, get a hunting club together, and you can hunt on um, our company's land. With changes in ownership norms and the rise of investor ownership, hunting leases are a serious big business in the South now. Um, and as an informant of mine who manages land for investors told me, uh, raising lease prices is often an easy way to generate returns um, from shareholders. So um, these are some quotes from interviews on the screen. Um, but yeah, I've heard this time and time again that any time a property changes hands from one investor owner to the next, the, one of the first things you'll do is raise the rates on hunting leases. Um, and so, yeah, this is big business now. A lot of these leases end up getting managed through these online systems. This is Rainier's system, a company that you know originated in Washington State. Um, I think Rainier is like a portmanteau of Rainier and some kind of fabric, but nevertheless, I, I digress. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, this is a screenshot of Rainier's system, and it shows where they have properties open for leasing. The average cost of leases, people have told me, and I see this sort of reflected in this snippet, is about $10 an acre, which is not cheap because you're not going to hunt on one acre of land. Um, but they can go for upwards of $15 an acre, depending on the amenities that are provided. This is so different from the, here's your free firewood, here's your free coffee, come get these deers, you know. Uh, so many of the people I've interviewed in timber-reliant communities in Georgia have told me that functionally this change in how hunting leasing works has meant that functionally hunting is no longer available to them. As the prices continue to climb, leases are not affordable for the people who live near these properties, and there's also not a lot of public land in this part of the world, so effectively if you're not able to hunt on private land, you're really not able to hunt. And many people have told me that these leases are increasingly being acquired by people in Atlanta or people from Florida who are driving four or five hours to their communities to hunt using these expensive leases while the people that are actually living in these places are really not able to use the woods anymore. Um, so uh, we see something similar actually with permit systems in the Pacific Northwest, um, uh, Weyerhaeuser for example, but a lot of these companies um, basically, any Timberland owner now uh, either has leases or permit systems like this that are either managed by like a large centralized company or if they're a really big company like Weyerhaeuser or Rainier, they'll manage them in-house. Um, but these tree farms in the Pacific Northwest that I was like, um, that I'm going to be looking at that are um, depicted in some of those images I showed are mostly closed to access. Um, so I was able to drive around the Millicoma tree farm in Coos County with an activist at one point, but it was only because she spent several hundred dollars to get a key for the year um, to be able to go into the property to, I mean, for her, I think it was for, um, for activist type purposes, um, but for a lot of people, right, to hunt, to camp, to collect firewood, et cetera. And things that used to be, I think, a little more lax, like um, foraging for mushrooms, um, and other things like that are also often by permit now. So we see a real transformation as we have different owners with different investments and different sort of uh, value systems, um, really changing the culture of how people use these private forests. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll call it. If anyone has any questions, comments, thoughts, would love them, have lots of editing to do on this. So whatever you can offer is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Um, I don't know much about this. What you kept saying vertically integrated, what does that mean? So a vertically integrated company, both own, in this case, with, the, with regard to like a timber company, they both own their land and they own mills. They uh, have their own loggers. Basically, they employ their own workers. They process the wood themselves, and they own the land. And this model was extremely standardized and normal for a long time but is, I think, increasingly broken down since the 90s. Uh, as you were talking, I was uh, 
reminded of uh, like Cop City and the forest in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Have you has your research paralleled with that like land use or the change? I don't kn know too much about that history, um, but. Yeah, I was just curious if you have seen any parallels with that in your research. Yeah, um, that's a really good question, I think, especially because one of my research sites is Georgia. But I usually work in rural areas where we have like really big tracts of land. That said, I've seen some interesting alliances built. Um, maybe it was last month I was at a conference in Portland that was protesting a Timberland investment meeting. Um, and at that conference were also people from Stop Cop City and also people um, coming from Ferry Creek in Vancouver. Right? So this sort of bringing together of struggles by different groups who are concerned with um, the question of who owns our forests and what they're using them for. Um, has your research made you come to any conclusions about how we should structure forest ownership? Or, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's hard, I mean, there's so many dimensions to this, and it was hard to know like, how much information to give on any individual piece. Um, but to me, one of the points that I really try and make in the book that I think is really critical is that investor ownership has radically changed the time frames in which people hold land. And I think that a lot of this lack of investment in road maintenance, in community relations, in these things has to do with the fact that we are seeing turnover of forests that is shorter than like one rotation of, um, of growing trees. So it's gotten a little bit better over time, but some of the earlier shift, or some of, you know, in the earliest iterations of investors owning Timberland in the 90s and early 2000s, it was sort of a standard 10-year investment. These funds were structured in such a way that you constantly have these properties changing hands. And when we think about something like I mean, some of Weyerhaeuser still owns many of these tree farms that these properties are on, which is why it's possible for me to do this crazy drive around and see what's going on there thing. But a lot of the other owners, the ones that decided to focus, like Georgia Pacific or International Paper, that focus on processing now, sold off all that land. And that land is, uh, those are properties that are very often changing hands. And so to answer your question, I think it's really hard to invest in long-term sustainable, um, forest management, and I say sustainable, both in terms of making sure that the trees are grown in ways that are, are positive. A lot of the, um, the tree farms that I've looked at in the southeast, for example, use a ton of um, herbicide and, um, and fertilizer because you know, you're on these short time frames, so you're trying to speed up, speed up, speed up. Whereas, and I think that's unhealthy for the trees, it's unhealthy for water, for soil. Um, you know, you're trying to, to get as much profit out as fast as you can. And so I hope it's a helpful answer, but to me, I think one of the things is just trying to slow this down a little bit, maybe not, not having our forest changing hands constantly and each new owner trying to figure out how to squeeze out at least enough to pay for the money that they put down to buy the land, um, you know, being beholden to a lot of these publicly traded companies, being beholden to shareholders who are needing regular returns. And so, you know, we see a lot of timberland being converted to housing developments. It's just, I think, the model does not conducive to long-term sustainable investment in the, in the sense, I mean investment in the sense of like caring and management and that sort of thing. Um, hello, um, my name is Mina. I'm one of the CCAS interns here, and I had two comments in regards to this presentation. The first one that I thought of was in regards to how private ownership is being used for public recreation. Um, have you done any research on Hip Camp? Um, mm -hmm. Hip Camp is a app in which you can go camping on private um, properties. Mm -hmm. So like my dad uses it a lot, and he like, went camping on like, I, I went camping on a lavender farm once and I'm, you can like go camping on people's land okay. and this is kind of like a smaller scale of what you're speaking of so you might find that interesting. That sounds really interesting, um, And yeah. it's spelled, yeah, H-I-P-C-A-M-P. -P. Okay, hip um, camp. Yes, and then the second thing I was thinking of was um, I recently read the book um, As Long As Grass Grows which is um, a book about indigenous environmentalism mm -hmm. and in the book they were speaking about how what we often regard as like natural beauty of like our national parks and stuff. For example, Yosemite was one of the case studies that they referenced. Um, Yosemite, as it was found by the colonial settlers, was actually like managed by the indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. And so this concept that you brought up around how law, like 
logging companies are now talking about how like they are almost better for nature than nature is for itself is a really interesting concept to me considering that like what we consider to be nature has been something that is uh, in the US at least managed by people for even prior to colonialism so yeah um, it's just a really interesting no I think that's a really important point um totally agree with you. I mean, I think in order to talk about nature, we have to understand that there isn't this sort of pristine nature that is completely separate from people. And I think that taking these more decolonial or indigenous approaches is an important way of getting at that. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, just that, you know, it's been really interesting studying these large companies that own so much land and plant and manage so many of our forests because there's really interesting text in a lot of the archival documents I found from a lot of these companies where they almost have like a disdain for, for nature sort of left alone. Like they have this strong ethos. I, in, in other presentations I've given on other chapters in this book, I have these great images of them saying like, here's a natural tree and like, here's a tree that like Georgia Pacific's foresters have grown. Like we're so much better at this than nature, which is interesting uh, rhetoric that I think recurs in a lot of this as well. And then that comes up, like I, like I said, with like the, the deer habitat. Like we are providing better deer habitat in our clear cuts than nature can provide, you know? I guess I was kind of curious, um, just hearing about kind of a lot of the shifts in the kind of like, um, the, the ownership of land influencing the use of it. Um, mm -hmm. Like, um, through like the lack of public access, but also the acceleration of certain industrial things like the conversion to housing developments and you know different kind of methods for logging. Mm -hmm. um, are there any sort of like um, have you have you like looked into at all like the way that um, kind of climate change and those sorts of things will in, like impact the sort of more terraformed areas um, and how that might like impact surrounding areas. So. How, can you repeat how climate change will, oh, I missed um, a word that seems will, important. Oh yeah, how <laughs> climate change will impact those um, kind of now more like kind of terraformed areas and the population surrounding them? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, I mean, in general, climate change is gonna affect Pacific Northwest forests in ways that will make them, I mean, while people are trying to invest in genetically modifying trees and finding ways to help them grow faster. I mean, fundamentally, the forests here, given the locations of a lot of us, are very like fog and mist dependent to sort of thrive, right? Like they need a certain type of climate and no matter what you do to like speed up the trees or change things, if the climate's changing, the forests are gonna change and that's sort of a hard thing to contend with. But I have a really concrete example that I found really interesting from my fieldwork in Georgia where I would suspect, well, I mean, I've talked to a lot of people. I, there's a sort of a mixed bag on is climate change happening or not. Um, but a lot of people who I'm not even sure would say that they believe in climate change have told me that basically they've had to change the kinds of trees that they're able to plant. So this is some inside baseball, a little technical, but basically cheaply you can plant bare root trees with a machine in the Southeast um, with a tractor. They're just, they're just, trees with bare, bare roots and you just pop them in the ground. But because, but they won't, they need to have a certain kind of climate to take root. Otherwise you need to invest in slightly older, nicer trees, um, which are containerized trees. So they're grown in, in small containers. They end up going in a little bit older, but the catch is that they have to be planted by hand. So one of the things that's been really interesting there is that those hand planting crews are mostly from Oaxaca or Guatemala, and they like make these crazy circuits to do this replanting in increasingly short, like we see shorter and shorter windows for bare roots, so the only way to get the trees in the ground is to have them hand planted by these crews um, in a part of the country that's really hostile, as you might imagine, to these, um, to these folks. But yeah, so I mean, the companies are already contending with climate change because it's too hot for the trees to take, to take root. And like this raises a lot of questions about the interplay in the future between migrant labor and climate change, for example, which I think are gonna be really interesting to see how they bear out. Um, <clears throat> I didn't quite catch totally what you said, but um, there was a part where you mentioned that I think it was the private landowners were, um, they were taking actions like to counter the Wilderness Act of 1964. Mm. 
So I was just curious if you could expand on that. Um, yeah, totally. I know I realized as I was saying it that I should have added like another slide or something. I did drop the ball a little bit. Um, but you know, uh, as I think I showed, a lot of uh, the historical piece of this is coming from all these archives and all of these um, newsletters. And in addition to some of the things around hiking and camping, there are at this time also a lot of newsletter articles saying like, you know, we're providing, it's almost like a, before I think it was like a welcoming like, you know, we're part of the community, we want to keep things good well with our employees. This is a big sort of um, like Ford is post-war kind of employment situation thing that heavily unionized employees, the lifelong employees, right? So I think that some of what they were providing was rooted in that. And I think the shift into the 60s took a slightly more defensive tone to say, look at all these amenities that we're providing. We don't need to be locking up uh, land in wilderness areas because, especially in the Pacific Northwest, these companies, uh, I mean, a lot of their um, land base was like a piggy bank where if they couldn't get federal, they couldn't get like cuts on federal land from the Forest Service, then they always had their own trees to fall back on. And since the 90s with, you know, sort of serious changes in um, logging on Forest Service and other federal lands in the Pacific Northwest as a result of endangered species protection, um, that that land is you know, not as accessible. And so I think some of the thing I was trying to get at with the Wilderness Act and maybe didn't do a great job in the talk was around that, this sort of fear that those properties would eventually get locked up as wilderness and they wouldn't have access to federal lands as well. And so trying to say, well, look at all the great environmental benefits we're providing. I mean, back to this point earlier, right? Like, we can do better than Mother Nature. Our managed forests are even better than what Mother Nature is able to provide. Like, we don't need wilderness. We've got this great publicly available private timberland. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think that's really, like, the companies were pushing back so heavily on the sort of environmental legislation in the mid to late 60s um, that would have, I mean, ultimately did present challenges for them, right? Like, the Endangered Species Act fundamentally did make it so that they were not having access to federal lands in the ways that they did. I was curious about um, the relationship between, um, you mentioned it, like you mentioned scalar mismatch mm -hmm. um, earlier, and I, I was, I'm, I'm wanting to bring that kind of into this um, dissolution of the vertical disintegration that you're, yeah. And, yeah. Um, so I'm just really curious about, um, you know, kind of this uh, neoliberal evolution of um, transition or neoliberal uh, neoliberal evolution of like rhetoric around the yeah the transition into like this this like real estate almost you're saying like this like into real estate right um, yeah I think so, yeah treating something that maybe had multiple use right. an, an an ethos of multiple use into something that is more singularly real estate. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so I'm curious um, about the scale of policy that's happening based off of like community response to the transition, and if you're noticing um, a, also like a political uh, evolution in rhetoric that is both in favor and contending um, based off of community uh, participation and resistance. Yeah, okay, so if any of you could not hear, the question was sort of what sorts of policy responses have emerged as a result of this. And, you know, one of the things that I've found sort of surprising um, about doing this work, which I've been working on since like 2019, 2020, is there's very little um, community pushback. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I went to a conference, a counter conference to one of these investment conferences in at the end of September in Portland. And it was the first uh, event like that of its kind that I like literally flew just to, to go. And I went because, which is terrible for the climate, I know. Oh, but that's what I was judging you for. yeah, I, I can tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I was just like, this is the first, as far as I know, instance of activists. And it was, it was a really diverse group of of people, of people who are concerned about forest issues in a range of ways. There were, there were uh, tribal representatives, I think 350.org, other sort of more mainstream climate organizations and environmental organizations were involved. But I had not encountered any sort of public concern about this process that I study in any sort of serious way prior to this, with the exception of 
a small nonprofit in Oregon um, called the Coast Range Association who's been working on this for a long time. Um, it's interesting because I have a lot of colleagues that study similar processes in agriculture, right. and there's so much pushback on this around things like land grab, like the, you know, people use the phrase land grabbing for like agricultural investment outside of the United States in the, in the global south, or there's a lot of concern about foreign ownership of farmland in the United States, um, maybe for better or for worse, like maybe we could be focused in other aspects of it, but yeah, it's just, it's really surprising. I, I think a lot of times when I present this work or versions of this work, people are very surprised to learn that investors own so much forest land in the US. Um, and so I would hope that there would be a bit more, but um, yeah, maybe you all can take to the street. We can all take to the streets after this. <laughs> um, yeah, in one of my courses, we're talking a lot about um, people's sense of place in their surroundings and their understanding of home, mm -hmm. especially in relation to climate change and how that's affecting their understanding. And I was wondering if you came across that at all in your interviews with people. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, in interviews I've done in Oregon, I think it comes through a lot clearer with people basically saying, like, I used to use this sort of patchworked public-private forest as like a singular unit. I'm used to, you know, having access to the land that I live right next to, and now with all these gates, you know, I live in a rural area and there's nowhere to go, or there's like no way to get to the place. It's harder and harder to get to the places where I would go before. Um, so I think there's some of that. On the flip, you know, one of the things that I've found very surprising and wasn't expecting is, you know, I was talking about doing this work in the southeast and people saying, you know, functionally it's harder and harder to hunt. And I would have thought maybe there would be like a critique of we're concerned about this community. We're concerned about who owns land in our community. We're concerned that like in the, for example, in one of the places where I do field work in Waycross, um, like European pension funds, so like Belgian and also Canadian pension funds own quite a lot of the land around people. And I sort of maybe would have expected there to be a stronger critique of like these foreign absentee owners. And I'm not, I'm not like asking for that. I don't think there's anything wrong. You know, I, I just anticipated maybe in that part of the world that there would be a concern about foreign ownership. Um, or about absentee ownership from people that are not particularly invested in the community, that are not giving back in the same ways, but was actually really surprised that I almost across the board got like a, these are, you know, I respect private property rights, uh, even if it's like changing my notion of where I live and what I can do there, that, you know, private property is the most important thing and I, I don't want anyone telling them what to do with their land. So I sort of see both, I've seen, a real range, I guess, is what I'm saying in terms of what communities I'm in and how people's notions of home and their norms of where they go and how they understand themselves to be related to the forest do really vary. So I'm not exactly sure how I'm gonna put this, but okay. <laughs> the way that you just said that um, kind of made me think of like my little reflection that I wrote of your presentation. Um, and it basically goes along the lines of realizing that so many different private land rules and regulations and laws and that kind of thing, making it increasingly difficult for people to have access to not only local lands for hunting and for foraging and that kind of thing, but then in reverse, having a large effect on people's ability to eat locally and to be connected with their local lands and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so like, if this is not relevant to your book, then please just like food for thought for you, I guess. Okay. Um, but it just seems like something super relevant to our class as well mm -hmm. um, that I think would be a really cool way of you maybe incorporating it into the book. And I guess maybe if you have anything to like say on that at this moment, because um, it was just super interesting to me and kind of realized how much that is. Because I'm the kind of person that's like, I'll go on private land. If I get caught, I'll just play stupid. Yeah. But like, um, as you just said, not a lot of people are like that. And so I find it really interesting also with all of us knowing that like this private land wasn't even ours to begin with. So yeah. Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> no, I appreciate over. that. Um, yeah, I think, so the, the comment was kind of about Food system impacts on food systems yeah. and the ability to eat locally or like know your local food system that you don't have to go and like buy, but that you can like forage for if it's mushrooms or hunt for or whatever. 
Oh, totally. I mean, yeah, there are a number of scholars whose work I really like who do research on, I mean, I, I think when we think about, maybe not we, but um, I think the, per, the average person who doesn't live near a lot of forest land might think that something like foraging is not a common practice in the global north. And I think there are a couple of scholars whose work I really like that really underscore how important things like hunting and foraging are for rural communities and how problematic, like what I'm saying, right, that, that closing these areas, off gating them, is, uh, or just charging, making them expensive. I mean, it's, the gates are, are movable for a fee, but that's not really the point. If you're foraging or you're hunting, you're presumably doing it for some sort of subsistence reasons, and so you're not able to pay those, those costs. Um, no, I mean, I think this is really changing people's relationships to the forest, and I think here, like you said, you would just go, um, I think there's, that's because of this long-standing culture that I outline in like going all the way back to the 40s and 50s in um, making people feel welcome in the forest. And now it's kind of this slow pullback of that. Um, but yeah, I, where was I? I was somewhere recently um, where uh, someone was talking about huckleberries. Um, there's, you know, important for a lot of the tribes, and they're being totally overpicked, um, and there's, there's less and less places to go to forage for them, right? So, um, yeah, I, I got the important takeaway to not buy any huckleberry products from that, but I, I felt like that was an example that felt relevant to me in thinking about when I when I talk to communities, when I talk to people about how this is in, influencing their lives. Like, if you used to have access to a lot of land, and it's now you have access to less, and you are foraging for huckleberries or mushrooms or other other things, or um, collecting firewood even is a big thing, right? Like fire, there's like permits. Many of these companies in these permit systems, like I showed, uh, you can get you can pay for leases only for mushrooms, only for firewood. It's just such a different. So everything is like monetized individually, you know. Additionally, to further respond to that line of thought, like, I mean, the ability to be able to trespass on land is also, like, a written-in privilege, right? Many bodies of color, I mean, yeah. we continue to see that property, our property is more important than your life. Mm -hmm. I read that yesterday um, in Inside, Enjoy, Inside and Joy by Ross Gay, and it's just like, you know, the right to the land, the right to food, is not, it's not a privilege. It should not be a privilege, right? And to those who do not have that, that is a disprivilege to them, mm -hmm. right? And so, like, when I just think about, you know, trespassing on private property, who gets in, who gets out, I mean, like, how, can you even own land? Like, we, let's be so for real, you know? And yeah, totally. I just... I just continue to think about that, that line, you know, like, in, in the book it was written, you know, like, my... Uh, excuse me, like my was in parentheses, and then it was like, property is more important than life, right? Mm -hmm. But then it was like your life in parentheses, right? Yeah. And like that is what is written in, into like all of these laws, all these no trespassing signs, you know, like we don't even, like in Salem, like it's illegal for you to sit down on the sidewalk, like there's a no sit law, you know, and this is getting like, you know, s distributed through what had previously been public land, yeah. you know, and like continuing to gate access to public land that we all collectively own together and owns us, right? Um, it's, in it's inhumane, and I mean, we're seeing it, there's privatization of toll roads now, even on like major freeways and stuff like that. So, I mean, this is just kind of, you know, an another canary in the coal mine showing how our rights as people are being taken away for the rights of property. Uh, thank you for your presentation and kind of maybe piggybacking on things that have set, been said, but I'm wondering about the aesthetic dimension given how much time we've now spent looking at this. Oh, image. yeah. <laughs> um, is it just a pullback? And I know you, I have no idea, but I'm assuming that the choice of words carries a context with it. And I want to frame the question of, is it just a pullback or is it a financialization? Is it a privatization? Is it a racialization? Is it a change in the narrative around rights? Like I've heard that's from the audience questions. Yeah. Specific way I want to frame this, is it just a pullback or do you have thoughts? Because I think there's 
I'm going to call it an aesthetic dimension of what's <laughs> happening as well. The, the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s images that you showed us. The history of um, Smokey the Bear, for example. Yeah. There was definitely a different aesthetic that went with an invitation or a welcoming. So the specific context in this, in this area, especially on this campus, there's been a lot of mobilization around recreation and public property, specifically the legacy forest debate. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how your framework and context might or might not be correlated with what people are finding out with regard to the legacy forest debate, specifically around rhetoric and quote unquote a pullback. Okay. Um, so the, the question, I guess there's two parts. One has to do with the legacy forest debate and the other about sort of is this privatization, is this pullback, is this financialization, is this something else? Um, so I would argue this is, I mean, the title of my book is called Landscapes of Finance. And in the sort of more theoretical chapters, I make an argument um, that this is the result of financialization. I mean, we literally have um, private equity firms and publicly traded real estate investment trusts managing our forests now. Um, I have a chapter where I sort of try and make the argument around financialization that follows how forest taxation changes over time, um, sort of leading up to the fact that, and this is really unusual, but um, trees themselves are taxed as capital assets, um, which normally that would be like a factory or something like that. And I, I try and make the argument that the the fact that trees are understood to be capital assets or investable assets, going back almost you know, to the 70s, 80s, is like a really important precursor for this being a particular, um, an, a place in which widespread investor interest and ownership can grow. Um, I guess that was an accidental pun, grow like a tree. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would argue that, that we should understand this to be the financialization of our forests. And I'm also not like glorifying, I mean, your comment about the aesthetics I think is interesting because this all just looks so, like I'll go back to some of them, right? Like it's just so charming. Look at all these white people having fun and camping, you know, but um, what was I gonna say about this? I don't. Uh, okay, I totally lost my train of thought, but We're talking about the, aesthetics. the aesthetics of this, yeah. Um, oh, I think that they, you could sort of glorify this as like a nicer time, like people often do with the, with the 50s, in, in, and this is really what we're dealing with here, but I think that it's also a depiction of like a fundamental shift in capitalism from a sort of corporate paternalism. Like a lot of this is like a very strong kind of corporate paternalism. Um, these are union workers. These are people who are multi they you know, they graduate from high school. They have a job, a union job for the rest of their lives. Like this is like supporting strong rural economies, which again, there's all these other dimensions to this that are, you know, these are also very white communities. There's a lot of other things going on here, but, um, I really do think, and I think that the aesthetics are very like consistent with that era, but I really do think that there is, that we do see like a really fundamental shift in, um, you can, you can, like I've said this to people, to friends and things before, like having looked through these, this arc of these corporate newsletters that you can literally like follow how capitalism changes over time through them from this sort of paternalism and then you, you know sort of the OPEC crisis emerges in the 70s and the 80s and 90s you have sort of like all you know maybe you don't have your pension anymore but you are a shareholder now and we need like continuous improvement and all of you know globalization is happening and all this log export stuff is coming up and you know it's really I think it's really interesting to follow uh, corporate newsletters like this too, which are trying to put a particular vision forward, right? I'm not, I'm not, I'm treating these as texts, of course, they tell us a lot of things. I'm not like sort of taking them at face value. They're trying to communicate to employees, to communities, to shareholders, to all sorts of people, a particular vision of things. Um, but I also think, yeah, the, the literal aesthetics change over time in ways that I think also reflect changes in how the economy functions over time, um, which is really interesting. Um, the legacy forest piece is a question about pullback. Um, I don't know. Uh, can you say more about 
what you're thinking around legacy forest stuff. It's just I'm, I'm way worse on public uh, land stuff than I am on private land stuff. So, um, I'm wondering if there's a parallel, and I don't have the language for it, but the whole creation of the notion of a legacy forest was to reestablish the right, part of it was to reestablish a public right on public forests, yeah. which were being privatized. And you're looking at a quote unquote pullback of in what was once encouraged as private rec or public recreational use on public lands. So there's some sense in which, I don't know I what the diagram would look like. I see, yeah. yeah. No, I think that makes sense. Um, I think, one thing I might say on that is like the categories of public and private are really broad, right? And like I'm looking in the past at private land, I'm looking in the present at private land, but like what something being private means changes a lot over time in the same way as I think what public land means and like what agencies we're talking about and what kinds of rights and access to public land exist is really variable within the category, right? Um, and I think one of the things I try and get at with the book in my focus mostly on private land, but people using private land is to show that also these are not hard, public and private are not hard and fast categories with like a huge divider between them, right? So you see the privatization of public land in the same way as we used to see the publicization of private land. I know that in uh, England there's more of a movement to, uh, for like access to private land. Mm -hmm. Um, and they've had a little bit of legislation on it. Uh, do, do you see any um, uh, any other like international policies or like, legislation or movements that would um, help that we should uh, move towards to get like the access for hunting and? Yeah, I mean, I don't even have to go international. I think there are. Very, there's variation from state to state in the U.S. Um, so my my PhD dissertation was about land trusts. Right, we have tools to acquire on behalf of the public particular private rights um, from private actors, or to to regulate or allow access to private land um, by compensating landowners. So we have all sorts of tax incentives at play that can be used to ensure access. Um, the other thing I would say is, um, I guess similarly on the tax incentives piece, this varies a lot from state to state. A lot of the, the lake states, a lot of states in New England have um, varying degrees of um, doctrines of implied access. So the idea being that you have access to private land unless it is explicitly posted for trespass. Um, and some of my dissertation work was in Maine where they have extremely strong um, implied access laws, and if you uh, if your land is proximate to a public body of water, for example, you can't post for trespass on parts of it so that the general public can access those waterways. Um, a lot of states, um, if you hold timberland, you often pay reduced taxes because of the long nature of the investment in theory, right? Um, you're not going to harvest for a long time, and so a lot of um, states it, including, I think, Washington and Oregon, I should, I do know. A lot of states, most states that have a lot of forestry in them have like these kinds of laws on the books for reduced property taxes, but many states require access of varying sorts as a caveat to giving these reduced tax incentives to forest landowners. And so I think there are actually quite a lot of tools that could be, there are a lot of models, there are a lot of laws and tools that are pretty mainstream in our own country where we don't, I don't think we need to look outside necessarily. But I think you could reform some of the timber taxation laws in Washington or to require public access or to at least require access to logging roads or to make it so that people can get to public lands that are very proximate to private lands. Um, yeah, it feels like actually not particularly complicated to me to, but as many people pointed out, what does it mean to have, who has access to private property? What does it mean to sort of be on private property when people are hostile to that, if you're a person of color or you're, you know, so I think there's still a lot at play, even if like in a very technical sense, there is a way to make this more open, but if there's a lot of hostility towards it or like, just because there are laws means people don't break them, right? You can still like, keep your gates locked and just be like, oops, it was an accident, you know? 
I was curious about the kind of the commentary on the evolution and seeing like um, a philosophical like uh, expression through this sort of thing that you've been keeping track of and you know just thinking about the um, development or the yeah the evolution then too of the financialization if I'm saying that correctly um, how do you what if you can deduce based off of looking through the past understanding the present what is what does it look like for us like for these companies moving forward with after this transition like what is the what are what is what do you think they're kind of like gunning after basically or what would it, the result of this transition be if that makes sense like what am i concerned about in the face exactly. of this coming down the pipeline exactly. in the future yeah um i'm really worried about communities that work in this industry mm -hmm. and are invested in forestry because so one of the things that has come up that's really concerning to me um, is I think I was saying there's this speed up happening where people are holding land for less time and they're trying to figure out how to get as much biological growth as they possibly can. And so there's a lot of really, really gnarly genetic modification. I, there's always been for decades and decades, you know, seed selection, genetic modification of plantation timber, but it is, like one of my informants described some of these trees as like a, like a thoroughbred that could die from the common cold. Like they are so engineered for growth that they're starting to not have like resistance to other sort of normal tree issues like pests or disease or, or climate. Um, and the other thing is that there's a lot of lock-in for lower value products, which is, you know, I think it's bad to be cutting and planting and cutting and planting. It would be better to have longer rotations with more volume that could be used for lumber or paper or a variety of uses, but that involves a sort of patience that I think is really not in play right now. And so my other concern is people have told me that the move to speed this up both through fertilization and through these sort of super genetically modified trees means that the rings, they're growing so fast that the wood is bad. Like the rings, there's so much space between them that you can only use them for paper pulp, which is a very low value product. And so um, basically, you know, it doesn't give that kind of flexibility. A lot of people plant a tree, markets change, things change. Maybe you decide to, to let it sit, to grow it into lumber instead of um, pulp wood, which is much younger wood. But if you're growing these trees, that are not capable of making lumber because they've been sped up so much, I could see a really, uh, yeah, I could foresee some stuff around that that's really concerning in the future. Um, and yeah, it's like you want people to make a good living off of the forest products industry. You want people do work in this industry and you want to make sure that you, how do you keep a lumber mill open if you can't feed it, you know? And um, also kind of similarly on that note of um, like kind of those, as you said, like kind of thoroughbred trees that could die from the common cold. Um, I, I'm not necessarily sure as to all of the kind of context on this, but when there were the fires this summer on the East Coast in Canada, mm -hmm. um, a lot of, I think it was like the trees that burned down were like monoculture ones that were planted by private yeah. corporations to like offset certain carbon emission things for tax cuts. Um, are there like, uh, in, in your new book, do you think you're gonna look at um, kind of situations that are not, um, or would that be considered private equity? Um, um, or would you look at situations that are similar to that, that are kind of like um, approaching the situation to um, the way that land is? I, I guess this is primarily about access, but I don't know. No, no, I, no, I, I just want to clarify because I think my understanding is that most of the trees in Canada are owned by the federal government. Um, something like 90% of Canadian forests are crown land or public land. And so, um, but a lot of the responsibility, but is then leased out to private companies and a lot of the replanting responsibilities on those companies that have these like logging concessions with the federal government. Um, 
So it's a slightly different situation in our model. It would be as if most of the private companies in the US logged Forest Service land only and then were required to replant it. Um, but to the, so on that, then the question is around, you said something about carbon credits, I think. Um, I, there's a lot of carbon at play in a lot of this investment property. And um, that is, you know, I, I said at the beginning, like there's sort of three prongs to this. One is around labor, one is around recreation, and the third is around value. And I think this carbon question, this carbon offset question is coming up all the time in these investment spaces where I'm doing my field work. People are obsessed with trying to figure out how to offset or how to how to get involved in carbon markets in ways that allow them to continue doing what they're doing kind of. Um, and actually a lot of these actors surprisingly have sort of steered clear because I think they are extremely wary about getting wrapped up in these kinds of long-term contracts that aren't working for them. Um, yeah. I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah, I'm just kind of picking at pieces, but. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. All right, well, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Kelly.